said that reading makes you more empathetic as a person. It's a way to escape your life. Uh, it can take you into faraway lands or put you into other people's shoes. And a good read can even help you sleep better. Today, we're going to find out how the book, the novel, The, uh, the, the Pale Tiger by um, Mike Harrison is going to, and it's got a very, very intriguing storyline. So we're going to find out a little bit more about that. Don't go away. We will be right back. <laughs> If you have just joined us, welcome. This is the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgette Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa. And our live stream is made possible by Creative Edge, StreamYard and Be Life Media. A special warm welcome to you, our audience, because this is an audience-centric show. So whether you're joining us over on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, Twitter or over on Amazon Live, a very warm welcome to you. Now, I am... Keep it. I've got an, an eye on my phone here, so I'm watching the comments. If you want to say hello, um, if you'd like us to give us a, sh a shout out because it's the first time you're watching the show, we'd be very happy to do that. Now, the Writer's Corner live show has been going for well over three years. And uh, if you have a look, if you're watching us over on Amazon and you have a look at the storefront there, you will see a whole host of books because over the period of um, of over three years, we've interviewed a host of amazing authors. But today, our featured author is going to be Michael Harrison, and he's going to tell us what's all behind The Pale Tiger. Very intriguing, so do stay with us. But first of all, let me give a shout out uh, to Stephen, who's just joined us over on Amazon. And I want to introduce my amazing co-host, uh, Mary Elizabeth Jackson. Mary is a special needs and disabilities advocate, and she's also a ghost writer and an award-winning author. Her latest book is called Cheers from Heaven with Thornton Klein, and it focuses on bullying and uh, the lessons we can learn from that and how it empowers families to grow from that experience. Mary's in Nashville. I'm in Cape Town. So wherever you're joining us from around the corner, and I know Stephen is over in the UK, so we are truly global. And I think our guest is also joining us from the UK today. So we're very, very global. Wherever you are joining us from, a hearty warm welcome so let me just invite my co-host to the show mary welcome to the show hi <clears throat> how are you today i'm good i'm good i'm good can't complain and i'm very excited to be talking to our, um, our author today the pale tiger mm. is such a you can't really tell what the storyline's about but oh my no. goodness <laughs> yeah, it's very, um, what I like about it is it's very multi-layered. It's got a lot of action. It's very action-packed. Even if you just go and read the details about it, the synopsis, you know, the reviews, it gives you already a taste of, okay, I've got to pick this book up and read it. And so I love how diverse he is. Um, and um, he empowers women. So, of course, we like that. Uh, and we won't give too much away because we'll, we, we want to have him talk about it. But we're really excited to have him here. And he is in London also. So we are truly global this morning. I want to say hi to our friends everywhere. If we have friends in Ireland watching today, our friend Robert, who is one of our buddies, we want to say hi to him as well. So we're really excited to be here. And love that technology brings us together this way. You know, so love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Talk about technology. One of the things that I'm very, very passionate about is helping you level up because, you know, we meet online now. We can't meet in libraries the way that we did before to talk about books. And so we do shows like these to um, to highlight 
the story behind the story with the authors. But in order to do that, you need a little bit of technology, as Mary just said. And uh, we both use the Logitech uh, Brio camera. Which I can't yeah. show you because it's over there. <laughs> but Virginia <laughs> can. Yes. So it might be smaller than that, I think, but I love it. it. It's, you know, it gives you a clear picture. It, um, it looks really fantastic. So. Yeah. So we both use the Logitech Brio. It's got uh, a trademarked right light um, and HDR technology, which means you can use it in any lighting condition. So you don't need to be a real tech guru to be able to get a great, um, picture online and then of course you know we both use studio condenser microphones i've got the samsung um microphone a condenser microphone is fantastic if you want great sound because people will tune out if you if your sound is not um audible so do be aware of that or otherwise you can use one of these lapel microphones if you just want to level up and this is the road the road lavalier microphone so though that's also another option that you can um use but anyway we want to dig into the story behind um the pale tiger so for and those we who love our we love our british friends don't we just love them yes we absolutely do so if you have never met or never heard of Michael Harrison before, he's a, a Cambridge lawyer who spent 30 years at the heart of the global financial markets. That's an, and, uh, That's an That was an interesting, interesting life, I am sure. Yeah, and he spent time in Manhattan, in Moscow, in Frankfurt, and even in Singapore. He and, sounds like uh, a secret agent, doesn't he? He does. He yeah, does. Like he, he could does. be a spy or something. Yeah. <laughs> we very even very intriguing. Yeah. Very intriguing. And uh, he says he incorporates what he has learned over the years uh, into his writing, giving it some authenticity and credibility. And I think he's achieved that with this book. But let's get him onto the show, shall we? Because no one else can tell his story better than he can. Right. Mike, welcome to the show. So glad that you could join us today. Thank you very much. Um, nice to see you, Bridgetti and Mary, and thank you so much for inviting me on. Oh, we love your. I love your room. It's it just has a whole mood about it. As as an author, you know, it's it goes right along with uh, somebody writing a very detailed, yes. fascinating the, story, the, doesn't the it? Light and shadow. <laughs> yes, there you go. I love it. Nothing five going on here. <laughs> The, am the ambiance is intriguing. Yes. So we're going to dive right in because there's so much. We've got a gazillion questions we would love to ask you, but I'm afraid we don't have time. So we're going to try and ask you Squeeze questions that we think in as much as we can like to know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to dive right in with asking you, which of the characters um, in The Pale Tiger do you most identify with and why? I, I think I think Anne Perry. She's one of the two main protagonists. She's a she's a detective based in London, uh, but she's very much the the sort of the, the person who finds themselves uh, in a world for which they're completely untrained and unprepared. This is the world of the the pale tiger, full of dirty money, corrupt agents, ruthless assassins. Emma Emma Wilson, who is the other main protagonist, uh, who is an elite MI6 agent, she's been trained for that kind of work. Um, but Anne is very much the kind of woman, she's almost like the woman next door, the kind of woman you might meet in a West London book club. Well, what made you, what prompted you to write The Pale Tiger? And and as we're talking about it, I'm also wondering, you know, where did your inspiration, have you always loved thrillers? So, is, you know, is that what prompted you to write it? And I'm seeing a movie, like, we're, you know, I can already see a movie. Yeah. 
Um, well, um, the answer, of course, is yes, I have always enjoyed uh, geopolitics and thrillers. And my career has not been in that area. But if you're in finance, you're always rubbing up against uh, the realities of the geopolitical forces, which are obviously are always fundamental in terms of shaping markets. Um, but I also wanted to be to do when I left the city to do something a bit more creative, to, to invent characters, to give characters a life uh, and to see them. Um, put them to the test also in how they'd react in different circumstances to really challenge them and push them as well as to give them an art which hopefully gives them a a, um, a, a sort of a satisfaction a satisfaction and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a conclusion that will inform their lives and make the reader go along with them. Mm, very good points and very important when you're writing absolutely. Wow that is that is amazing. So a little bit more about Theodora. Um, what is she? And can you also tell us if hedge funds like Crater Capital um, have sophisticated computer systems which provide analysis with vital information? Mm -hmm. Well, Theodora is a, is a, is a fictional, uh, I'd say she's, a, she's not really a character because she is a machine after all. But uh, what I'm doing here is I'm I'm sort of introducing the audience to the concept of general artificial intelligence or hard artificial intelligence. Now, that's not a technology that exists nowadays, but we're probably only within one or two years of that technology being a reality. Uh, and this, this foresees a, a machine, a system that can perform any intellectual activity that a, that a human being can, but obviously faster, more efficiently, and a machine of that, with that kind of cognitive power, it will learn to learn. Now, there's obviously people who have divided views on artificial intelligence. Some see it as a force for good and other people see, see it as something which is inherently dangerous, something which once once created uh, will have a life of its own because us humans can, will never catch up with it. But for the purposes of this book, uh, Theodora uh, is, a, is a hugely powerful processing, uh, processing tool. Uh, one of Crater Capital's um, main um, uh, strengths is its ability to, to map shipping and the movement of goods around the world, sea states, tides. Um, and this is uh, a vital part of uh, how the Pale Tiger plot is laid down and created. So she is a, entirely a fictional character at this stage, but uh, and I almost call her a, a she, because a machine with that kind of ability would almost seem to most people to have a personality of its own. Uh, yes, absolutely. And certainly people who write um, films and stories give those uh, artificial intelligence um, personalities, uh, you know, so we do see that and expect that, don't we? Yeah, very much so. And, uh, you know, it, it, this is the future, you know, whether you're going to welcome it or whether you're going to sort of try and resist it, it's coming our way. So I think, you know, it's good to good to get your mind around it. Oh, you have to embrace that. And and you've done you, the other thing that you've done in this thriller is embrace uh, the power of a woman. And you've used two uh, two women in your story. And what um, what, you know, Emma and Anne, what made you want to do that with your characters? Have them, you know, first be both female and second be as empowering as opposed to maybe one's very powerful, one's vulnerable, you know, or, or a weaker, you know, they both seem like Two powerhouse women. Mm. Well, I mean, given given the the what what the, the way the story pans out, you know, they've both got a lot to do. You know, whether they like it or not, as it were. Uh, and I like the juxtaposition of you've got Emma, who's you know this is her this is her sort of bread and butter. She's trained for this kind of rough work. She knows what to expect. She can handle herself. And Anne, who is as I mentioned at the, at the start of the program, she is an she's an ordinary ordinary policewoman put into an extraordinary situation. So I wanted the audience to, you know, alternately as they're as they're reading about and living the, the adventure through these two characters, to feel on the one hand, you know, the slick professionalism of Emma and how she handles the, the peril she's put in, and then Anne, who has to learn a whole new set of skills just to stay alive in the murderous world of the Pale Tiger. Mm. Very, very, very exciting. Very exciting. And talking about exciting. Um, I'd like to know what it is that you find fascinating uh, in the relationship between the United States and China. Now, there are two powerhouses. Um, and do you think that the 
fictional scenario that you portray in the pale tiger do you think this could happen in life is possible well to answer the last bit first uh it very much could happen uh, and i'd like to think that uh, when people put this book down they could amongst other things be thinking well i wonder um, as to the relationship between uh, China and the uh, United States, obviously this is the big question of the 21st century, how America deals with the rise of China. Now, this is obviously not a, not a, not a unique uh, situation to history. Um, history is full of examples where the, the rising power grates up against the sitting power. Um, and the, the, unfortunately, history gives us a rather severe lesson in this respect in that uh, these kind of confrontations usually end in war. Um, now, um, um, people say nowadays, you know, that, that both China and America, you know, neither side wants a war, and therefore, you know, there, there, there simply can't be a war. But I, I'd caution the complacency that goes with that statement. Um, for example, I was recently reading the news headlines from the Times newspaper for the summer of 1914, on the very eve of the First World War. And in those days, we had Germany, the rising power, grating up against the British Empire. Now, unlike today, the news headlines then were really rather amicable as regards relations between Germany uh, and Great Britain. I mean, the Kaiser and uh, the King were cousins after all. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the US president, concerned about the buildup of, uh, of war talk in Europe, sent a special advisor to tour the capitals of Europe. And uh, in July of that year, uh, Edmund House, the president's special advisor, gave a press conference on the streets, on the steps of Downing Street, saying he'd spoken to all the European leaders and he can confidently assert that neither Germany, Russia, France, nor Britain desire war. And within a month, all four of those nations became embroiled in the most bloody conflict the world had ever seen. So whatever you view you take on the situation, as I say, the... The, the, the dynamic between the US and China uh, really should be forefront in our minds uh, and, and the need to, to manage that situation and to move forward into something that is, is something that, that is more like peaceful coexistence mm -hmm. rather than a constant cycle of attritional, attritional confrontation. Uh, yes, and, and we've been in a period of time for the last year and a half, almost two years now of quite an incredible period for our whole planet um, mm -hmm. and for all of us to be able to see, okay, we have a playground here or a, whatever you want to call it, a sandbox, we can all get along. It's the best for the whole of humanity is mm -hmm. what we should, you know, would be really good for us to strive for. Um, and to have those conversations continue, 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 um, that maybe someday <laughs> that could happen for all of us. Would be wonderful yeah. well i mean i know mary that you're a great student of history as well and i, and I did try to put, put this story frame this story in a, in a historical context um you know the relationship between china and america is not just a very recent thing it has ancient roots as well um and you know when you stand back and, and really look at the whole picture the whole question of the balance of power globally in a, a longer historical context i mean that actually gives one more sort of room for optimism in the sense of yes there's been times in the past where the grating power, the rising power does uh, end up in a, in a military confrontation with the city power, but it's not always the case. I mean, for example, when the British Empire was fading and the United States was the rising power, the, the handover of power, if you like, was, 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 a, was a peaceful one and, and, and the result was a, 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 pr a productive uh, coexistence that benefited all sides. Mm, absolutely. So do you think that um, there's a possibility that in real life hedge funds could go to um, such extreme measures as the storyline tells us to protect the assets? That's a good question. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, given the eye-watering amounts of money involved in this world, you, you really wouldn't want to rule anything out. Um, as I've said in the past, you know, you, the, 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 the center of, uh, of global markets, it's a, it's a strange place. Uh, it's a kind of a, a toxic nexus, if you like, where power and money can warp the best of ambitions and, and fan the worst of them. Mm, 
Yeah, we would love for you um, to read uh, a bit from your book. Would that be okay? Of course. Of All course. right. Wonderful. So let's introduce you to um, Emma Wilson. Yeah, will you hold your will you hold the book up so everybody can see the cover? There we go. But there not hide your face. There. Right. So Emma Wilson on her way to the airport. She's she's being sent to Hong Kong, trailing a principal at Crater Capital, uh, a leading London hedge fund with rumored to have links to the Chinese government. Uh, her boss, Sebastian Noon, head of counterintelligence, is, depending on your interpretation, either briefing her having a chat about this, that, and the other, or grilling her as he as they drive to the airport. Emma Wilson of MI6 strummed her fingers on the armrest as she looked out of the car window. The traffic around them had come to a halt. The headlights of the cars behind glinting off the raindrops splashed across the side windows. Should have taken the tube. Sebastian Noon, head of counterintelligence, consulted his watch. No need to fret. Your flight's not till 21.45. Can't miss the pre-flight briefing. She smoothed down her British Airways cabin crew skirt, ran a finger under her neckerchief. He turned towards her, his patrician features smudged in shadow. Is it as comfortable as it looks? Feel like I'm wrapped in prickly cling film. She shifted in her seat, enough static electricity to power a small town. I think it rather suits you. And the blouse, she rolled her slender shoulders, like wearing cardboard. She pulled out her vanity mirror, checking her lipstick and I won't even start on the hat. He gave a slight nod. Who are you, by the way? Emma held up her flight crew ID hanging from the lanyard around her neck. Noon slipped off his spectacles, narrowing his eyes. Really? She reached behind her neck, checking the pins that held the sweep of dark hair in a tight wound bob. I don't get to choose the names. Mixed blessing, I suppose. He tapped the driver on the shoulder. Do you know what the hold up is? Nothing on the radio, sir. Just weight of traffic, I think. Sebastian nodded, bent forward, flicked a switch. The glass partition sealing the front from the rear seats rose almost silently, slotting into the rubber seals with a click. Emma took a deep breath, staring straight ahead. He turned towards her, deep set eyes framing his aquiline nose. I'd like you to be nervous, she didn't reply. Noon stood his spectacles on. What have you done with my ice cold Emma? He gave a slight tilt of the head. You worried about working with Mackay again? Emma shrugged. Fifteen years ago? I don't think about it. Don't see why he would. Any contact with the man since? Haven't needed to. That wasn't exactly my question. Mm, that's that was good. You know, listening to you... Um... It really draws us into what's going on. It's so believable, isn't it, Bridgetti? I'm just like, oh, keep going. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I just wanted to keep going. This, this is good. <laughs> yeah, forget the rest of the day. I'm just going to sit here and listen to Mike Reed. <laughs> wow, I'm intrigued. Oh, I, I mean, I've read, I've read a lot through the book, but I'm like, I have, I don't think I've read that part. But I, you, you have left us on a cliffhanger, so. You know, anyone who's out there watching with us right now on the replay or whenever you see this, the 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 show, you've got to go get this book. And it's it's you know gift, it's gift time, it's a good time for buying books, isn't it? So, Mike, is there a sequel in the works? I mean, this book is a cliffhanger. Are you planning a sequel? Yeah, in fact, I've just finished my next book. Yeah. Uh, and uh Anne and Emma are back. Uh, this time, this time in a, another sort of high octane, high stakes geopolitical thriller, uh, but this one is set in the world of cryogenics. Oh, uh, fascinating! So, anyone out there who's looking to produce a movie, I think these should be turned into movies. <laughs> I'm putting my vote in. <laughs> oh my goodness, Mike, that is amazing. I mean, your storytelling is phenomenal. Um, do you have any tips for any new authors that are watching? Because being being able to write in such a manner to have a great hook and then to be able to hold people's attention so they want to sit up all night with that cup of coffee and just 
can't wait to turn a page is it takes a lot of skill do you have and any talent. quick tips for authors yeah and talent. Now, I, 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 th I think i think it's important to 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 get to get to know and to get to like your characters um mm -hmm. you know if you you know once you once you find yourself with a real interest in you know what that what they're thinking what they want to do what they might do you know the, the the characters almost you know make the decision for you you know you're it's almost like your hands on the keyboard are, are being guided by you know Emma wants to do this Anne wants to do that Sebastian wants to do that yeah, uh, they tell you what to do <laughs> yeah 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 i mean even the baddies you know you can yeah. have the good lines right you know they're they're yeah. sort of you know you've got to you know if you give your baddie a, a sort of a if you can like a you know a nice sharp sense of humor at least you, you know you don't mind spending time with him whatever he's up to <laughs> that's true <laughs> you know it, it, it's so funny you always talk to people who uh oh you don't always talk to people but when you get the opportunity to talk to someone who's an actor or or a writer um i think they almost enjoy the baddie as you call them you know more than anything and i know like my daughter is working on she's at over a hundred thousand words in a novel and when she got done writing some big scene with her bad character she was screaming <laughs> And I was like, what's happening? And she's like, oh, it's so exciting what he did, you know? <laughs> and it's just, it's really fascinating, isn't it? Because you get to live out, like if there's that part of you that you don't want to express in life, but it would exist within each of us, right? Like the curiosity yeah, is about things. Yes, because we know the parties can go off and do things that, you know, the, the three of us would, would, would could never consider, would never consider. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just... But you know they're, they're the ones without the limits, right? And right. You know, the, the so-called good guys, people on the side of the angels, you know they've got tram lines to operate in, right? Absolutely, yep. yes. That so, is amazing. So anybody out there, because Bergetti asked you, you know, about uh, do you have, you know, what besides really getting to know your characters and everything, if someone wants to go into this genre. Um, you know, are there any greats that you studied under or because, you know, I hear stories about um, authors who say, go read everything that's in romance, you know, um, go, you know, go read your your favorite authors and, and learn their skill of what they're doing if you can't have a class with that person. So, you know, what would you tell anyone out there who's wanting to write in the genre that you're writing in that well, way? I wouldn't, I wouldn't really think so much about style because I think it's, I think you know one has to try and kind of wait, make one one's own style. You know the way that you're comfortable writing and the way that you want your characters to sound and and you know in, in, and talk on the page. I think more important is to, is to to just kind of keep your eyes open and just to find something which you know is something that interests you, something that is it's that's big and it's real and it's relevant to an audience. I mean, for example, one of the reasons I began to write the Pale Tiger was I, I remember. I saw a headline once, um, and there'd been a near miss in the South China Sea between a Chinese and an American warship. And I remember just thinking, hmm, one day there will be a collision. And then what would happen next? Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Mike, we've, we all, we're just about out of time, but I've got a final question for you. I love, 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 love the cover of this book, um, you know, and just looking at it on the Kindle, there's so much detail in this, you know, it's, one can tell that there was a lot of forethought in, in the cover. Just tell us a little bit about the cover. Well, I can take absolutely no credit for the cover whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The cover was designed by, uh, by my publishers in the US, Echo Point. Uh, and they, good job. they did a good they, job. They, you know, they, they came back with this and of course, you know, my, you know, I, my, 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 you know, me, my agent, everyone has said that is absolutely terrific because it's sort of it's busy. Hold on a second. It, it gives yeah, it, it's, it's a good flavour of, you know, what you know you can expect a lot to be happening inside. And this, yes, I was just saying that, that's the idea. Right? Brilliant representation that you, you've got so much, so many layers happening in the book, and it's on the cover. They did a brilliant job, and we know a book cover can make or break a sale a lot of times. Very true. Yes. Mike, thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, and I, you know, I sincerely recommend that everyone who's
watched us today live and want to say thank you to our live audience and anyone who's watching this um, later. This is a phenomenal book, phenomenal storytelling, very intriguing, a tongue twister. Um, so please go out and get a copy of The Pale Tiger and we can't wait to have you back on the show with your sequel. When when are you expecting to have that out? Because we'd love to have you back on the Writer's Corner live show. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, we're just talk, talking with publishers at the moment. So hopefully before too many months. Yay! Oh, awesome. will, be, will be out there. And yeah. uh, no, uh, uh, Brigetti and uh, Mary, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, and thank you also for the very kind words uh, about the book. And also, you know, a, a very good morning or good afternoon to any of you watching. <laughs> And, uh, and or I good do, night to anybody who's going to bed, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, obviously, I do hope you enjoy The Pale Tiger as much as I enjoyed writing it. I can't wait to watch the movie. That's my vote. So, <laughs> thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Until we, we'll see you back next week, same time, same place for the Writer's Corner live. Show. <laughs>